to call the Fabian Society. So two-tier Keir Starmer in Britain is a Fabian socialist. The Fabian socialists are not new. In fact, most of the prime ministers in most of the British Commonwealth throughout almost all of history, Australia, Canada, and so on, have had Fabian ties if they weren't outright Fabians. I think it's true, somebody can fact check, it's either every or almost every prime minister of Australia has been or been connected to the Fabians. Um, you would know the Fabians probably by their softer name that they frequently use in public, which is the Labour Party, which is a little bit scary when you realize how well they've been doing. INGSOC, I-N-G-S-O-C, was an abbreviation, a creative abbreviation for English socialism. And changing the E to an I, I think is really clever because it has that idea like they're just barely hiding themselves. Um, this is exactly the same English socialism that Engels criticized as not being able to get its act together. But their goal was um, very different. It was actually to very slowly infiltrate and subvert. This is when uh, this, this model, I was gonna tell you something I haven't told you yet. This is when George Bernard Shaw said, that's later. I've been reading my notes so that you haven't read yet. Um, they were going to infiltrate and take over from within, which should feel very familiar. You hear Klaus Schwab say, penetrate the cabinets. Well, that's a very English socialism method um, although that does have roots back to Lenin. Lenin said the best way to control the opposition is to control it yourself or to become the opposition from the inside. So this infiltration conspiracy thing, pretending to be your enemy, there's an old saying that's on. By the way, I think the Tories low-key are, are that, you know, and a lot of rhinos are that in America. You have people that are, you know, Republican in name only is what it stands for. So what was Orwell writing in 1984? Orwell was most likely, he, nowhere does he ever explicitly say this, there are strong hints in his Road to Wigan Pier, but he nowhere explicitly said that this is what he was doing. But the best guess of what 1984 represents is characterizing the Fabian socialists spending a century to gain the power of Stalin. The Fabian Society was founded in 1884. Now, Orwell was tricky. He published 1984 in 1948. So he said that he just sw swapped the order of the number of the year. But as a matter of fact, um, it's very likely that he was imagining the Fabians operating slowly for a century. They have a... My grandfather was an old school Fabian communist in Australia, was out of the party by the 50s, found his uh, Great Britain Shaw. Oh, yeah, I know his... What's his name? G.B. Shaw, yeah. Omnibus when I cleaned out Nana's house. That's crazy. By the way, to know who the founder of this party is, let's, let me play a quick video for y'all. Look at, look at this. This guy's a creep, by the way. We'll, we'll see another video of his, but he, he's, he's a weirdo. Well, you may take it from me that the news from Germany is the very best news that we... By the way, he's talking about Hitler's Germany, by the way. He's, he's a weirdo. ...have had since the war. Ever since 1918, we, like all the... By the way, Nazis were socialist, by the way. So... I know that's confusing, but they were. The other powers have been behaving just as badly as we possibly could. Well, now, when Germany was defeated, when Germany fell, they went and they sat on Germany's head. And they kept sitting on Germany's head. Although it was quite possible, quite evident to any sensible person that they couldn't go on like that forever. Then there came a very intelligent gentleman named Adolf Hitler, and he, knowing perfectly well that the powers would not fight, he snapped his fingers at the Treaty of Versailles. That was what got him a vote of 95% of the whole population of Germany, even including the very people whom he'd been treating rather hardly just exactly as if we in England had been in the same position, as if the powers had beaten us and sat on our heads. Then the first man who had the gumption to see that we might get up on our legs and defy all those old treaties, he would be the most popular man in England. There can be no peace in the world until there is peace between England, France, Germany, Russia, the United States, and all the big powers of the West. Now, take that home and think about it, and don't be frightened anymore about the Germans. Wow. He chose a, he chose a, an interesting side. Okay, so let's finish this. Symbol that's a tortoise, or a turtle. I think it's a turtle, not a tortoise. And it says underneath it, when I strike, I strike hard. So you slow. Oh, yeah. Let me show that to you guys. I prepared for this. Um, so yeah, <laughs> this was their symbol, <laughs> man. It just gets weirder and weirder. Fabian society, 100 years. When I strike, I strike hard. I mean, I, I checked everything.
slowly, 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 slowly infiltrate. And then all of a sudden it's like, it came out of nowhere all at once everywhere. The British right now are all asking in the UK, how did this happen so fast? It's like, it didn't. It happened over a hundred years and they didn't tell you until they thought they had enough power with these last couple of recent big wins to reveal themselves. So when I strike, I strike hard. So they, by the way, I think they show in America, they showed themselves, I think 2020 with the uh, George Floyd situation. And I think that that woke up a lot of people that were like, something's off. So they actually, I think they went a little bit too early and they showed their hand. I think now Kier's showing his hand. Um, but I don't know if, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Hide themselves and then hit as hard as they can all at once. But like I said, this is the model of incrementalist socialism. It's basically the long march through the institutions, British style, as opposed to Marxist style. Um, and because of this difference, and we're focusing on communism and, and Marxism in particular, that's why this is a uh, kind of tangent. Their goals are political, cultural, and corporate capture from within. Those are their main agendas. Infiltrate the boards, infiltrate the committees, infiltrate the governments. They use education as much as they can as a route. So the most famous educational institution they founded is called the London School of Economics. If you go there, there's a gigantic globe outside on the campus that is upside down. So turn the world upside down is the imagery. The big players, the big characters, there are more, but I'm going to name George Bernard Shaw, Sidney and Beatrice Webb and Annie Besant, but there were lots more. This isn't a big Fabian lecture, and I'm actually not qualified to give a deep Fabian lecture. Um, there are people in the room who are, so I'm not going to embarrass myself that way. There's a symbol that they have also at the London School of Economics, which by absolutely dumb luck, um, the whole team here and I had the uh, good luck to see with our own eyes last, uh, I guess, October. We walked over to the London School of Economics. Mike, who's doing the sound and speaking, uh, the voice in the back, um, has had this vision of seeing the Fabian window, which is a stained glass window that they had made of themselves for years and years. It's in the George Bernard Shaw Library at the London School of Economics. They don't let people in for whatever set of reasons. So we show up, we're all dressed up, and it turns out that there was a funeral in, in, in the room. So we're dressed up and we say, can we go up to the, to the George Bernard Shaw Library? And they say, are you on the list? And we say, what list? And the guy doesn't, being very British, doesn't want to say we can't go to the funeral. So he says, oh, just put your names on the list and go on up. So we put our names on the list. We went on up, we crash a funeral, we see the Fabian window. There it is, it's real. Um, it's really fun. Uh, so we actually did see it, but the idea is it shows George, George Bernard Shaw and I think Sidney Webb with hammers and an anvil between them. And on the anvil is the earth heated to red hot and they're beating it while the other Fabians are working the bellows, which would be similar to the British version of Lenin's agitprop to heat the world up, smash it to bits. And it says across the top, remold it nearer thine heart's desire. So they're going to heat the world up, which I think we're experiencing right now. I mean, that's crazy. And you see that emblem in the middle? That'll come up later. I think he'll address it right now. But this is a scary, scary imagery. And they this is how serious they are. This is why whenever we talk about Islam, we got to talk a little bit about this stuff because it, go, it kind of goes hand in hand. And it's borderline more of an issue. That's why I think you guys see me posting about stuff like this because it goes hand in hand. This is the stupid ideology that will allow Islam to come in and cause its problems. So they're both, I think, almost just as bad. Now look at look at Britain under Ingstock. Now look at the heat. And then they're going to smash it to pieces, and then they're going to put it back together the way they want. In other words, they have predetermined solutions for the crises that they're stimulating. And it's actually, there's a stained glass window uh, commemorating that that's their vision. Um, it turns out that George Bernard Shaw, his, his play My Fair Lady, was originally titled Pygmalion. We talked about the Pygmalion myth last night. Turns out that's exactly the same thing. You're going to see if we can take a street rat and convince people she is what she isn't. And it's actually a, and if she is, then she gets to, you know, basically the gentleman win the bet and maybe she gets to pretend she's a noble for the rest of her life. Now these guys at the Fabians rejected violent revolution, so they're not Marxist. They're still communist. Actually, you'll hear George Bernard Shaw in a second say that he's a flaming hot communist, but they didn't, I, they did not like the idea of violent revolution. This is all subversive, which is why it fits into this besides being Western. So this is a difference of methods, but not beliefs. As far as the underlying religious beliefs of transforming the world, we just heard the Fabian window. Man, I've read like multiple of this guy's books. This stuff is so deep that I have to constant. I have to reread books. I have to rewatch lectures. It's so. I mean, it's a lot like Islam, right? It's so stupid. There's so many different denominations of this stupid religion that I don't even like. You have to go over it so many times. So it's the same thing as Marxism. But the methodology is not revolutionary, like violent revolution style. It's subversion, Antonio Gramsci, infiltration, Paulo Ferreri. It's, it's dark. No, actually portrays that. And imagine making a stained glass window 
which is kind of, you know, we associate those with churches, um, to, to commemorate that that's your view of the world. On that window, by the way, I think I have it in here somewhere else, but I want to just point out they have their coat of arms. The coat of arms for the Fabian Society is literally a wolf in sheep's clothing. It is Isn't that crazy? That's the coat of arms. I didn't know about this until now. You know, the more you know, man, I stumbled on this accidentally. It's literally that. You can look it up yourself whenever you want. It is literally. Look, go to your search engine, type in coat of arms Fabians, and you're going to see a wolf in sheep's clothing on a shield. So this is a difference of methods, like I said, but not of beliefs. Here's George Bernard Shaw saying exactly that. He says, until you have socialism, you will never have state solidity, because as we know, if you have private property, you will immediately split your stake. So there it is. He's against private property. He said, you'll get the class conflict, the class struggle, the confrontation of interests between the proprietors and between the proletariat. And therefore, you have something that is crumbling, that is divided against itself. And then he added, as a red hot communist, I am in favor of divided against itself. Does that sound familiar? Fascism. The only drawback to Sir Oswald Mosley's communist, I am in favor of crumbling, that is divided against itself. Let me go back a little. And then he added, as a red hot communist, I am in favor of fascism. The only drawback to Sir Oswald Mosley's move, movement is that it's not quite British enough. I really encourage you to look up some, uh, some videos of the things George Bernard, Bernard Shaw said so you can hear it in his squeaky little oily smiley voice. Um, turns out this Oswald Mosley was a British aristocrat who was a socialist and funded a lot of socialist activities and got pissed off that it wasn't going fast enough, it wasn't working, so he became a fascist. I don't get it, what do you mean? Just in the early 1930s. And so what's INGSOC? What is, what is English socialism? It's communism with British intelligence characteristics is what it really, what it is. And it operates through infiltration to set up a liberal conservative dialectic in the cabinets. In other words, a uniparty, we call them rhinos, or we used to, we call them NatCon now. That's a very controversial statement. But it's Klaus Schwab's penetrate the cabinets method, which is, like I said, has links to Lenin, but it's very British and slick and polite and kindly. So here's the kind, the sickly kindliness and I really, really hope you'll look this video up. You can watch this. We'll definitely have to throw this in when we put this together of George Bernard Shaw actually saying a very sickly, kindly, very communist thing. Um, and it's really. Oh, the wolf in sheep's clothing, clothing like they will act nice. They will act like this is the, the, the in the best interest. They act rational. They act like this is the betterment of the current society and for the betterment of Britain and the country. But they will later expose themselves as wolves. And that's dark. That's bad. We don't want people to operate in deceptive tactics. Um, especially when they're politicians that are supposed to be elected by the people. Great in his oily little voice. So you'll get the, what you need to search to find it. It's very easy to find. I don't want to punish anyone. But there are an extraordinary number of people whom I want to kill. I'm not in any unkind or personal spirit, but it must be evident to all of you. You must all know half a dozen people at least who are no use in this world, who are more trouble than they are worth. I think it would be a good thing to uh, Make everybody come before a properly appointed board, just as he might come before the income tax commissioner, and say every five years or every seven years, just put him there and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? If you can By the way, if you like Tommy Robinson, if you are anti-legal immigration, you are one of these people that, that, that should be killed. You got to remember, the guy talking right now is the leader of the group that Keir Stromberg is a part of and a lot of the politicians in general. So just remember that. Can't justify your existence. If you're not pulling your weight in the social boat, if you're not producing as much as you consume, or perhaps a little more, then uh, clearly uh, we cannot use the big organization of our society uh, for the purpose of keeping you alive because your life does not benefit us and it can't be a very much use to yourself. So you thought... I mean, that's crazy because, I mean, how are, how are white people, um, non-leftists being treated in general in the UK right now? Does it feel like that? Does it feel like your existence doesn't matter? Because that's what I'm seeing. I'm not even there. And based off how he's communicating, you should know which group that you would fall into because you are no use to the state. And if you're no use to the state and they have absolute power, man, watch out. Like My Fair Lady was cute. It's not cute. This dude's a demon. Kindly, gentle, 
I don't want to hurt anybody. And he does talk where he talks about killing everybody or whatever that, that's of no use. Oh, we'll just put them in a nice chamber with nice gas that puts them to sleep and they just never wake up. No pain, no punishment. But you have to justify your existence before an Obama death panel every five to seven years, apparently. He also was a big fan, like I said, of the fascism. This, he's, so he's really just a kindly, gentle, more saccharine Stalin, this George Bernard Shaw. This is why I think Orwell had that fantasy of, of, of Ingsoc, English socialism, gaining the power of Stalin and characterize it as big brother. So here's another George Bernard Shaw quote. Hitler is a very remarkable man, a very able man. What Hitler should have done, so this English kindly gentle, what he should have done was not to drive the Jews out. What he ought to have said was, I will tolerate the Jews to any extent on condition that no Jew marries a Jewess on condition that he marries a German. So you think that this guy might be a eugenicist. He was, big time. So this is weird halfway, as you would say, exoteric on the outside, but also halfway esoteric. He's gonna obliterate the Jewish religion, which has matrilineal lineage, by making sure that no Jewish male marries a Jewish woman. They all have to marry German. So you're gonna breed the Jews out of Germany, was what uh, he said Hitler should have done. Which means he never really read Mein Kampf because he has this whole chapter of his race ideology that he got from Helena Blavatsky that says straight up that the mixing of blood actually waters it down and that's why you can't do it. Um, so he probably didn't read his Hitler, but he's got his kindly British way. He's very polite and very cheerful. He's always kind of bobbling. He looks like a living- And by the way, I don't know if he's gonna cover this, but again, you gotta remember like a lot of abortion Planned Parenthood was established by a eugenicist. Um, ab abortions have nothing to do with women's rights. I think people are more ready to hear that. I mean, I've known that for a long time, years now, but I think people are more open to hearing that because they trust the government very little at this point. So I think Bobblehead actually with a nice little beard and he sounds very polite and very friendly and he's saying the most hideous things you can possibly imagine. But you start to get this idea then of there's an opt-in tyranny. You know, I'll tolerate Jews as long as they do what I say, which is this actually extremely tyrannical thing. And if you don't want to, well, that's too bad. There's a death panel or we'll drive you out. Right. So it's opt in or your life is going to be terrible or maybe bluntly ended. Um, and you start to get this seed of the opt in tyranny. I keep driving opt in tyranny because we're going to talk about that this afternoon. And it's key to how everything works now. Fabian socialism operates on a model called the open conspiracy. Why? Because if the cons conspiracies are supposed to be secret. So if you just tell everybody out in the open what you're doing, people say, well, they can't mean that. They wouldn't tell us if that's what they're really doing. So they just tell you literally everything they're doing. You should see maybe The Shape of Things to Come by H.G. Wells. You should maybe look into what the Fabians wrote and say what they're going to do. They tell you extraordinarily explicitly what they're going to do. They don't hide it. This is like what demons do, right? They want to tell you what they're going to do before they do it. This is, they say, people say that this is one of the characteristics of demons. They, they have to get permission first before they can capture you. I don't know. I'm not like a demonologist, but... Man, how dare you call me, Joel? I'm going to ban you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, hey, Joel, did you review interviews from Corey Gill Schuster? Who's that? I don't know who that is. Because if it's out in the open, they think nobody will believe it. And guess what? Nobody does. So this is actually a throwback to those secret societies that Babouf and Weishaupt were members of. But you, now you're not going to hide the conspiracy. You're going to hide the conspiracy in plain sight. Um, this enables what are sometimes called open communications, where they can tell their followers exactly what the next thing to do is. I would suggest that the way that Keir Starmer is speaking in Britain right now is likely a lot of it is open communications. He's giving a veiled uh, indication to the thug, the gangs of thugs that they won't be prosecuted, but the people who stand up to them will. And that's called an open communication. They're openly telling you what's coming, but only the people who get it, get it. Now, Orwell characterized the power of the Fabians through Big Brother. Of course, right now, the UK is trying to even flirt with the idea of extraditing Americans who say things that inflame passions against Fabian interests in Britain uh, and arrest, extradite Americans for things they post on social media and arrest them in the UK. Like, I'm not getting on the plane. Like, <laughs> but imagine living in the UK. I mean, the memes are great right now. It's, they're showing a bunch of like Cheka and Stasi characters from movies or whatever. And it says, do you have a meme underneath your floorboards? But what Big Brother represents is not just a totalized surveillance state, but one that you're meant to love, one that you're meant to appreciate, one that's doing it for your own good and you know it. The very George Bernard. Yeah, I think they're losing that because, I mean, dude, Elon Musk, big ups to Elon Musk. I mean, how much of this stuff would not be out in the open if it wasn't for Elon Musk? I mean, that's how everybody's. And YouTube got in, got in line because of Elon Musk. I mean, before Elon bought Twitter, you were getting your channel taken down for very little. Um, but you know, Elon put them on notice and now it's a little bit more laxed, but I mean, pfft, nobody, I mean, you have a certain group of people that like Keir Starmer, but they're not, they're not getting this like, 
love that they could brainwash the the British people into, uh, like what was had in you know in Russia or in Mouse China. Art Shaw character. So it's a kindly, gentle opt-in version of Stalin's power uh, that's characterized in Big Brother. And really, the Big Brother model, the screens and everything in 1984, are used to contour beliefs of the people to increasingly get on the party line, or in other words, to increasingly adopt the theosophical socialist model. This is like what Mao did, but high tech, which gives you queasy vibes about what's going on in the world right now. Uh, of course, they've got the cameras everywhere. They're, they, they said that they have an entire police force dedicated to monitoring social media for incorrect posts. They're arresting people for memes and posts in Britain right now. So imagine what the kind of snitch state that you had under Mao might look like if you had the technology of today. And that's what I want to say is being coordinated. What's funny is they probably filtered people that were working for the intel or in the uh, police for loyalty to the party, right? And you do this adjacently, right? You can do this through acad the academics. The, the colleges are already creating leftist freaking psychos. So that's easy. And then you have, um, you know, it's you can do it pretty easily now because of indoctrination.